Good evening, and welcome to St. John for our midweek Lenten service. Uh, a reminder, actually, Louie and I were talking about this before the service. This is our second to last midweek service. Next week is our last Wednesday because the following week will be Holy Week. So just two more times to be together. It's been a delight, though, to have our midweek services. It's been a delight to do Lenten hold in service together, and so we should give thanks for that. Um, no big announcements. Make sure you have the order that we do things and also the booklet that tells you what to sing when. Those are important. If you need them, we have them in the narthex. Remember, too, to sign the fellowship book, the welcome book. It should be on your center aisle. You can pass it to all your neighbors, sign it, say you were here. And then if someone wants to take responsibility and tear that off and put it in the offering um, basket that's in the narthex on your way out, we'll count that all up. It's a friendly thing. It's a good thing to do. A sad note. I do want to share with you that Art Benke... Um, died early this morning, and uh, those of you who don't know who Art is, and I imagine that's not many, um, but he uh, was a faithful member here at St. John, and you could also find him playing cards in the community, driving his car all kinds of places, um, and he really was able to live his life to the fullest to the very end. But um, now Rosemary and his family mourn his passing. We mourn as his church family, and we have service info. This Saturday, it's a little short notice, but this Saturday we will have a memorial service for art here at the church. We'll start at 11 a.m. We'll have a visitation. Um, you can come and visit with Rosemary and family. And then at noon, we'll have a service, a memorial service, followed by a lunch downstairs. So if you're able to be here, I know it would mean just the world to Rosemary and family. Let's now continue with our service of light found on page two. And thank you to Aaron for being our leader and to Barb for being our accompanist this, this evening. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter in the darkness. Joyous light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face. You who sing creation's story, shine on every land and race. Now as evening falls around us, we shall raise our songs to you. God of daybreak, God of shadows, come and light our hearts anew. In the stars that grace the darkness, in the blazing sun of dawn, in the light of peace and wisdom, we can hear your quiet song. Love that fills the night with wonder. Love that warms the weary soul. Love that bursts all chains asunder. Set us free and make us whole. You who made the dancing star of night make us shine with gentle justice let us each reflect your light mighty god of all creation gentle christ who lights our way loving spirit of salvation lead us 
Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence of the light of our pathways and you of life of all creation. Amen. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Oh God, I call to you. May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. It's now time for our evening reading. Thank you, Anne. Good evening. Today's reading is from Joshua, the fifth chapter, verses 9 through 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On, that, on the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleaved cakes, and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day, and they ate the produce of the land. And the Israelites no longer had manna. 
They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This reading, thank you, Anne, again, from Joshua, follows, as we've been doing, these Lenten services midweek, from the lectionary the weekend before. So for those of you who were here Saturday or Sunday or maybe tuned in online, um, we talked about the prodigal son. That's what I focused and preached on. But this passage from Joshua was also read. It's the story of how the people who wandered, not 40 days, not like our Lent, 40 years, finally came to the promised land, finally were able to settle, to put down the roots, to raise the crops, and no longer needed the manna to feed them. The two stories, however, do have something in common. Well, they have a couple things in common. One is this idea of hunger. The Israelites that wandered were hungry, weren't they? In fact, they grumbled a bit when they first started out in the desert, that they had had more than enough to eat in Egypt, and now they were hungry in the desert. And God provided the manna. They probably were pretty tired of manna by the time they got to the promised land. And God said, no more manna. Now you can raise your own food. Grace there. The story of the prodigal son, if you remember, in Luke begins with the son who takes his portion and ventures out far away from his family, his home, and then a famine strikes where he's at, and he is reduced to going into the fields to feed the pigs as his job and even contemplates eating what they're eating. He's so hungry. Hunger and grace are the threads that connect these stories. I don't have a good drawing um, this week. I actually drew a picture of a shoe. Like last week, I had the picture of the fig leaf. but So I won't be showing a drawing this week, but a good commentary that speaks of grace, of God's grace, referring mostly to the story of the prodigal son and how that son was, was embraced upon returning home. But I'd have you also remember this reading from Joshua the people embraced by the land where they would put their roots. The Reverend Ashley Dittar Burt writes this commentary about prodigals, those things that challenge us. She writes, everyone has something that challenges them, that pushes them in a way that is ultimately good for them, but perhaps they weren't quite ready for. These things often help us grow as people and, and teach us important lessons, even if we struggle with them. For some people, it's a person, right, that challenges. Maybe it's a teacher or a classmate. Maybe it's a coach. For other people, the challenge is an experience. Maybe a book that brought new ideas, or a trip that didn't go as planned, or an assignment with an unexpected level of difficulty. For this author, a long time, her challenge was that story of the prodigal son. She writes, I don't think I'm the only person who has ever struggled with this parable, no matter where we see ourselves in this story, whether we see ourselves as the younger son who has gone and is now back, whether we see ourselves as the older son who always stayed and helped, or even as the father who ran out to greet that lost son it can be challenging to sympathize with all of them. Why would the younger son take so much half of the estate of the father and then waste it? Why wouldn't the older son celebrate the fact his brother was back? 
Why wouldn't the father, or anyone for that matter, bother to tell the older son what's going on? If you remember in the story, he wonders why there's all of this noise from dancing and feasting. He has no idea a party is happening. Trying to make sense of these characters is hard. It's hard for all of us, but eventually this author came to realize that every single one of those characters, regardless of what they'd done, receives a grace, a grace of some kind. Both sons, one wasteful and one frustrated, receive the grace of their father. And even the father, who could but isn't explicitly said to represent God, experiences grace in his interactions with his son. No one earns it, but rather it is something they experience together. Once we understand this, maybe we can begin to feel that the grace from this parable might extend to our own lives. There's no limit to the grace we experience with God because God puts no limits on grace. Our lives can be big, full, messy, complicated, imperfect, maybe even a wreck, and God's grace will still be there. This author encourages us to go forth, experience God's grace in the people in your life without limits, Remember both these stories of the prodigal and of the coming into the promised land from Joshua, where God said, no matter how much you grumbled, no matter how far you went away, I always welcome you back. Amen. We will be singing, and I'll know what we're singing when I turn my page over and I hold it at this distance. We will be singing, Abide With Me. We'll do verses 1 and 3. You can find it on 629, hymn 629 in the Red Hymnal.
Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness in life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God, praise and thanks to you. May God, creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all of us. Remember to go in peace, and we'll see you next week.